And are you still at the Zoological Research Museum? In Bonn. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, not yet right now because I'm retired, but uh, that's my affiliation under which I, I, I publish, yes, yes. So I did all the, all the digit, digitization of uh, my tapes and so on. I did that in Bonn, but fortunately this is now finished because last year, because of the pandemic, the access to the museum was really limited. And uh, fortunately, I finished all, most of it in 2019. And uh, we had a sound lab at the Museum König, but they closed that down because uh, the Custos was a vertebrate Custos, uh, Custos, Gustav Peters, and he retired. And that's why, um, why this lab, unfortunately, I think uh, was closed because they thought, OK, we don't need uh, room for tapes. The, the big player now is Tierstimmenarchiv in Berlin. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it would be interesting to learn about the different places studying bioacoustics in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. Baruj Ghani, who um, was, he was on the Zoom and who was at our center over the summer, he lives right now, I guess in, where is that, in Hamburg? Um, but um, That's right. He, he's been our connection to German uh, bioacoustic projects, at least mine. Uh -huh. um, so, should we get started? Yes. Uh, so now, just to finish that, I, I'm in Alicante in Spain, where I live. Yeah. Okay, in the very hot Alicante. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so should we start? Yeah, I'll give uh, just a very small introduction to um, somebody who spent decades um, recording um, the sounds of tropical forests with a concentration on insects in particular, but I think you've studied um, patterns in biodiversity more generally as well. And um, I can safely say you've been in this even before, you know, bioacoustics became a very hot and um, growing field, you were out there with uh, tape decks, making recordings of um, various species, you know, um, in the 90s and 2000s, and um, before we had this, you know, technological revolution. And so it's going to be really interesting um, to hear about all of your work in this field. And then also, you know, just selfishly as a um, somebody who works with terrestrial soundscape data, but doesn't know a lot about, um, you know, insect biology and what we can learn from um, insects in our passive acoustic monitoring data. I'm uh, very eager to hear your presentation. And so Klaus Reed is joining us now from Spain, but he's a senior scientist at the Zoological Research Museum at Bone, where he's recently retired, but I think still very engaged with what's going on there. And so, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, well, um, I got this invitation in uh, from Larissa, Insect Bioacoustics, and I said, wow, <laughs> that's a big field. But then uh, she asked me along the lines you just outlined um, to focus a little bit on uh, uh, what maybe vertebrate bioacoustics people should learn um, on how to avoid clutter or vice versa, maybe how to share their data so that insect people can appreciate their data and get a little bit more rapid in insect uh, biodiversity assessment. Okay, so the outline of my talk is defin uh, some definitions and history of insect bioacoustics, uh, and then an overview uh, about stridulation in insects, um, uh, with uh, remarks about some of those who made it into model organisms in neuroethology and neurobiology, which has a very strong tradition in Germany and also in the US, of course. 
and uh, bioacoustics. And finally, and that's uh, where we meet with um, soundscapes and uh, passive acoustic monitoring, bioacoustics as a tool for species discovery and monitoring. So early milestones in orthoptera bioacoustics uh, were Yerasin, who, uh, who painted scores of insect songs. Uh, then there's another important uh, promoter of insect bioacoustics, which went via the thermometer cricket at the end of the 19th century, uh, which made it into the newspapers and so on, that you could uh, determine uh, the temperature by counting pulses of crickets. And everybody got very enthusiastic about that. And the, there was a real hype or, uh, about lots of newspapers, uh, West newspapers, and people started with their stopwatches and so on and counting pulses. And from there on, extrapolate the temperature. That's possible for one species. Okay, then uh, uh, Reagan um, uh, in Germany um, in the uh, 19 something, uh, demonstrated song and phonotaxis in crickets by telephone transmission. So he made a telephone transmission of cricket song and could show that there is phonotaxis of the female. And in the 1930s, we had the uh, technology ready for first sound recordings. Well, in fact, uh, at the, uh, in the 19, 19 something, we already had these uh, wax um, uh, tape machines, but I think there are no relevant recordings um, of insects during that time. So a little bit later in the 1930s, 1940s, the first huge sound recorders appeared. And in the 1950s, analysis uh, equipment appeared which I will uh, demonstrate now a little bit. And then there's another uh, breakthrough, I would say in the 1960s, which uh, I mention particularly because you are vertebrate people. So it's Kenneth Roeder, which uh, uh, with his seminal experiments about uh, avoidance of uh, bats by moths, which with some spectacular um, shots illuminating the moths, evading the bats. Uh, and uh, I tried to find uh, this picture, but I didn't find it. And there should also be films. In any case, there's a good review, which I have linked down here. So, so this is uh, the grasshopper score by Alexander Yersin. There were some more from US scientists a little bit later. If you go in Biodiversity Heritage Library, uh, then you could find them. But uh, I think in this context, this is enough. So what you see here uh, are uh, 30, uh, overall he scored 38 species, even differentiating between closely related species like Cortipus mollis and Cortipus bruneus, and also observing silent stratulation by grasshopper larvae. They move their legs, but of course, because they don't have wings, they don't produce sounds. And what you see here um, already is, it's not the, so much the pitch, because the grasshoppers uh, produce a, a, a noisy uh, sound like shh, 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 shh. but the rhythm is very, very pronounced. So he it took some effort to demonstrate this rhythm and hear a crescendo and hear a little bit an impression of um, a lowering of the pitch, but basically it is the rhythm which is decisive and it's quite impressive how do you manage to, to capture that with this score. Then my personal hero is uh, uh, Al uh, Albrecht Faber, who was uh, sort of an outsider, but in any case he made uh, 
seminal work in the 1950s and it is called Sound and Sign Language in Orthoptera. So it's not all, only sound, it's also sign. And uh, he took great effort to, to describe meticulously uh, the sequence of movements which are accompanying sound in grasshoppers. There are some spectacular examples, meanwhile there are several of those are in YouTube, fortunately. And also Albrecht Faber made film and he made film with sound and we managed to, to digitize part of its archive and uh, made it available via the um, Orthoptera species file. Uh, but the book is really outstanding because it's so meticulous and still valid because it describes some species which hence have never been studied anymore. So then we have uh, the studies by Busnel, who already managed again to uh, film. I think they, they even did high speed film and synchronized that with oscillograms. So here's you see the oscillogram of a Tedigonid song. Actually, this looks like a today oscillogram which you produce by, by all the tools we have now on our, our PC. Of course, this was a huge apparatus and um, uh, you had an oscilloscope and the os oscilloscope was illuminating some, um, some light sensitive film and later on you had rolls of, um, of output of these uh, of these oscillograms. I still work with those uh, for some, some years. In, uh, at the end of my study time in the 1970s, the apparatus was still available. That was the pre-PC time. And they also managed to, um, to do some power spectrum. Don't ask me how they did that. Um, they had a special machine for that and they sort of programmed it, but of course it wasn't a computer. And of course they were well aware that there was a stridulatory file. So here basically you have all together what you need to, to describe uh, such a Tedigonid song. Basically today we don't have much more. We have uh, the power spectrum, which here is, is going into the ultrasound and we have the rhythm and we have the time scale. We have the oscillogram. Uh, the spectrogram doesn't bring much more information because we already have the power spectrum here. So that's, uh, that was a great progress and sort of um, triggered off a, a lot of comparative studies. So here you see a very short winged uh, epibiga, a teligonid, and uh, with very, very short, uh, short wings, but nevertheless able to produce sound. So here again, the sonograph, um, this is the sonograph machine. It's basically a filter bank. So here, this cylinder is moving while a tape is rotating in here. You have a two second loop of tape, which rolls and rolls and rolls. And meanwhile, this cylinder walks up and here you have filter banks and depending on what is passed through the filter, you get a more intense or more less intense coloration and you get an output like this, which basically looks like a sonogram. And I already, I also walk, uh, uh, work with this, uh, but then of course it became obsolete with uh, the development of bigger machines like MEDAF or so, uh, which were able to do the same thing, but much more elegant and you don't have to produce the two second loop and so on. So this was already a soft, uh, a hard and software, which basically does was what our PC does now, but of course it was huge. 
I think I have photographed somewhere before they closed our, our uh, bioacoustics lab in, in Bonn. And I think there was still some one standing around there. Uh, okay, anyway, let's stop here. That's uh, history. And uh, we can be happy now that we can do sound analysis everywhere and uh, very cheap, even in the field and so on. Uh, actually, uh, uh, when preparing this talk, I came across this beautiful book, um, which appeared right now, Exploring Animal Behavior Through Sound. And I found this beautiful picture here of ornithologist Peter Paul Kellogg uh, making recordings of the ivory woodpecker. And uh, Big equipment was still needed um, until recently for ultrasound recording. Ultrasound recording really was a problem. And I think the great breakthrough in ultrasound recording were these passive acoustic recorders. And I'm very happy now with the audio moths, which allows me for, for less than 100 bucks uh, to record high into the ultrasound with 384 kilohertz sampling rate. Uh, so catching all the katydids. So we are improving our um, data multimedia acoustic database on um, on katydids right now because um, what we have in our databases was often based on RACAL uh, sound recorders uh, with heavy ultrasound equipment, which of course was only possible in the lab. So publications, where, where do you publish all this stuff? Um, it started, of course, with uh, vinyl um, discs, which are still working. That's something I want to see our digital information where it is in 70 years from now. Then CDs, the CDs, well, you know, with some of my CDs, I have some difficulties. The tapes are already also still in good shape, but um, we are now at the critical age where, where the tapes are disintegrating, so they should be digitized. And uh, they are stored in phonotakes. For example, uh, we had several, um, several tapes in, in, in Bonn, and then we have the big collection of tapes in Berlin. Uh, Tierstimmen archive, and uh, then we had a lot of private archives, which uh, we were able to bring together uh, during our DOSA um, digitization project. Um, and this is because uh, many university people were working in neuroethology, hence making recordings. For example, Helverson in Erlangen had tapes, Schmidt in Hanover had tapes, and so on. We, so we brought this together just in time at, uh, in the 2002 or so. And Klaus Gerhard Heller and Secret English, they did a lot of work in digitizing that. And we, did, uh, we got a huge grant from the Ministry of, of Research uh, because digitization was just coming up. And then we have uh, the uh, Orthoptera species file. I will speak in a minute about that. I just a uh, picture of this book, and I just want uh, to say how important books still are, because if you are <clears throat> if you are searching the web for what I'm telling now for the things, you might get overwhelmed with uh, information and with very sophisticated studies. Uh, but basically, um, you probably get confused as an outsider, uh, because as I show, basically many of the concepts and many of the uh, of the basic data are still the same as decades ago. Uh, it's just getting more refined, and so we have an explosion of publications. But uh, that sort of clutters a little bit the view of, of the ascent. So 
um, some books are good and I, I, I will show you some in the course of the talk. So uh, this is of Dr. Aspicius' file. Unfortunately, it is, uh, it is a taxonomic database. So it is, it is focusing on, on um, uh, literature data, where have uh, species been described and so on, but it also has a lot of pictures of uh, museum specimens, but also of live specimens. And we started to put our sound recordings from the DOSA project into Orthoptera species file because we had the severe issues with the university server, which was in Ulm. And fortunately, we started to migrate the data. The migration isn't complete. And still, the database design for multimedia in Orthoptera species file is not optimal. Uh, but we are working on that, and um, we hope that we can sort of save our, our DOSA data, which are like of 6,000 sounds files from 621 uh, species. And meanwhile, uh, filling and populating the OS Orthoptera species database goes on. The good thing about Orthoptera species database is that it is always the latest uh, taxonomy. So they are doing continuous monitoring of new description of species. And one of the main problems we have in insect bioacoustics, if we go beyond the model of organisms and beyond the well-known European and North American species, we need voucher specimens. And we need a, 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 an association between the voucher specimen and the sound, because in many cases, the, the species is hitherto undescribed. Okay. So what are we talking about? We are uh, talking about um, frequency ranges uh, from very low infrasound up to 100 kilohertz, uh, so high into the ultrasound. And um, here is, let's say, the uh, 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 sound perception space of a cricket, which is perceiving with tympana in the front legs and with Circe with small hairs, wind sensitive hairs, uh, uh, which are going down into, uh, into the infrasound. So the infrasound is needed for uh, predator avoidance, like for example, this is another neuroethology paradigm uh, the toad, which is trying to catch the cockroach, the cockroach also has these hairs and makes an evasive uh, flight response. And uh, then you have, of course, the bats, which are uh, perceived by, by these tympanal organs. Um, both uh, these cockroach work as, um, and, uh, um, and the bat avoidance were studied in I think even in New York, Ron Hoy, do you know him? Maybe um, uh, he studied those. And, uh, and then there's this work about the giant interneurons uh, detecting the wind. OK, so uh, I hope do you see this side of the screen here. Um, uh, here. And I hope the sound of that doesn't disturb too much. Um, here I combined an evolutionary theory of insects uh, with those groups uh, which are able to produce sounds. You see, it's not only orthopterite and it's not only cicada, it's also lepidoptera and, um, and humanoptera and diptera and beetles, of course. Uh, hemiptera. I can't speak about all those, of course, today, and I'm not a specialist. I, uh, um, I'm mainly with orthoptera and a little bit about cicada, but I want to mention them because many of you are starting their career, and uh, I would say that most of these other groups are under-researched. Um, so there is a lot in moths, for example, 
there, there is a lot to do. And uh, for example, we have this audio moth, but up to now I couldn't identify a moth click, which evidently is somewhere out there, maybe for, for, for predator interference. Uh, so there is a lot of work to do out there. And I want to recommend this book here, Insect Sound and Communication. And um, uh, I will provide the link uh, when I make the version uh, to load up somewhere. Okay, so I want to present before I start with the orthoptera one example from a diptera of a, a model organism, and this is Drosophila. Uh, Drosophila uh, has a male courtship song, it has a female copulation song, it has sexual rejection sound, aggression sound. You see all characterized by a pulse structure generated by the wings. Now, don't worry, they, they won't clutter your, um, uh, your tape recordings because these sounds are very soft and they are working in the near field. So here we have sound velocity and uh, in the near field. And they have, be ha have become uh, a model uh, organism for uh, genetics, neurogenetics, and uh, the, the advances are really uh, surprising, going deep into uh, the neurobiology and deep into the control of certain neurons by certain genes. Fascinating stuff. Hearing in Diptera, for example, mosquitoes it is by the antenna, but by Johnson's organ in, in the male. You see here this bushy antennae by the male, which uh, don't hurt you. The females are blood sucking. And the reception of the sound is down here uh, by scolopedial organs. And then we have the uh, moths. Uh, the moths do, do have a tympanal organ here, you see in the abdomen, and different moth families have the tympana in different places of their body. And about the sound production mechanism, hmm, uh, this is uh, uh, a little bit messy. And as said, uh, in these uh, moths, um, we have sound signals directed at a predator, and we have uh, alarm signal directed as a non-predator, uh, and so on. So we have sort of an acoustic aposematism, and of course, we are the tympana uh, moths can uh, perceive bats, and then make this famous avoidance uh, maneuver which was documented by Kenneth Baruch. But as said, it's totally under-researched. So this here is from uh, Jack, which uh, uh, she made a nice review, which is linked here. And she's working on that, but I think she is the only one who has no review. And yeah, maybe you can invite her to your seminar. Then sound production in cicadas. This is a, a, a different mechanism. It's a click mechanism. It's like uh, if you have a Coca-Cola um, tin and you press, uh, you press it, you make a little sound click. And this sound click mechanism is uh, produced by, by big muscles here. Here you see the different patterns. You see impressive modulation of frequency and you see impressive bands, which are not harmonics. These are not harmonics, these are formants. And that means uh, that a cicada song could sound like wah, 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 uh, and can be described by, um, by a human vocal, actually. Uh, so a totally different uh, mechanism uh, from as we have now in Encephora and Cellifera in Orthoptera. 
we have katydids and uh, bush cricket or bush crickets, which are in cifera, which are these ones here, and which you can recognize by their long antennae. And uh, mainly we are speaking in the following about Tetigoniidae. Uh, though you have, even though you have sound production also in Grill Acridide and Ravidophoridae, Schizodactylide, again, a huge, a huge field, um, especially in those one here. Tetigoninidae is well researched, but uh, the other ones here, uh, tropical families, um, Terra Incognita, I would say. And then we have the Acredida, the Salifera, um, again, mainly in the Acredida, uh, we have sound production. And yes, so um, I'm an Acredit specialist, so now you will hear a little bit more about Acredits. So the basic sound production mechanisms in all uh, uh, Orthoptera is a, fi um, a, a file and scraper mechanism. So you have two wings here, which are sort of asymmetrical. One wing has this stridulatory, stridulatory file on the underside, this plectrum, and the other has a scraper. And uh, by moving uh, uh, both against each other at high speed and uh, uh, with a certain rhythm, uh, a specialized region here on the wing called the harp is radiating a sound. Generally, insects have a problem because they are so small. And the smaller you are, uh, the smaller has to be the wavelength you radiate. But as you know, crickets are well in the audible. And some are using tricks like battles or leaves to increase the radiation surface for their sound. I won't get go into that. Uh, this alone is a super interesting um, theme and I have suggested to um, Larissa to invite Fernando Montalegre, who is uh, still doing, continuing this line of work uh, which has been abandoned and he took it up again and is doing now very sophisticated work with labor, laser vibrometry to find out which regions of the wing exactly vibrate and so on. And uh, in Acredide, you have a different mechanism. It's basically a row of pegs at the inside of the hind leg moving against the hind wing. Uh, and uh, you see here against the uh, against the tegmina. So these are moved against each other, and uh, sound is produced. Sorry. Uh, there are some other mechanisms: uh, stridulation by wings in Romaleide, which are the lubber grasshoppers, which you have in in um, in the U.S and uh, they are producing very audible sounds. And there's also a very interesting species in South America of this group of lover grasshoppers who produce their sound by opening their wings and closing them, which sounds like a bird. So if you go into iNaturalist and listen into the sound recordings, filter by sound recordings, then then search for Prionacris, Prionacris. Um, and uh, these are the ones which are uh, sounding like birds. So I'm quite sure if you put that song uh, as a mystery song into Xenocanto, then uh, uh, interesting guesses will come up. I wanted to do that all the time, but <laughs> never did it. So maybe one of you is taking up this idea and doing that. Okay, so you see here rows of little pecs. So basically, it's always a scraper against a plectrum, like moving a, a, a stick against a fence. That's the basic mechanisms. And uh, then the sound is produced. Uh, here is this hind uh, wing resonator, which is also very nice because uh, this uh, Heolopteryx species is producing, is singing on the wing by moving, fluttering, which is wing, and uh, due to these resonance structures, 
um, you have a very either very short clicks or in this case here a ring like tone so very interesting i'm working right now about, uh, about that um, and it's not quite clear how the sound uh, is produced here it's probably like moving these veins against each other and uh, from there on from the disbalances uh, um, stimulating these thin area uh, on in this case on the hind wing and below is the tympanal organ you see here is the tympanal organ of the acridido of the short hot grasshoppers which is in the first abdominal abdominal segment okay so um, here's again the, uh, the tympanal organ. And this is from 1906, from Schwabe 1906, uh, which already uh, elucidated all the structure and so on by, by uh, microscopic dissection. Müller's organ, Müller, as you find, is a German name. He, uh, they did this in the 19 something, end of the 18th, uh, beginning of the 19th century. And here I won't go into detail, but um, um, uh, these are the grasshopper families which are singing versus, uh, versus the ones which are not singing. A lot of not are not singing. So here um, the taxonomic value of songs you see very closely looking grasshoppers from the cortipus group which are very well differentiated by the distinct temporal patterns of their songs so that's the great value of uh, grasshopper songs and cricket songs for taxonomy and finally i wanted to comment a little bit of history again and why we have so many recordings in germany because there was a big school of um of neurothology by von helversen and by my thesis supervisor um franz huber who wrote uh, this book about cricket and uh, behavior and neurobiology and the Helversons about a neural uh, basis of behavioral adaptations. And Helverson developed a method to, to uh, monitor the leg movements and the sound. And you see here, there's an optoelectronic device recording the leg movement. And here you have the sound output. So we exactly know how each movement of the legs and each position is producing which song and its behavioral function, etc. So the whole chain from the sound production to the brain has been elucidated uh, in both sides. So uh, muscle control, but also reception. So here you see is this optoelectronic device to, to monitor the position of the leg, here the microphone, and uh, here in this case, uh, the song has been electrically um, elicited and um, they wanted to study in these studies uh, the muscle activity which is controlling the song. Uh, this, I would say, is a closed shop because um, sort of everything of this chain is known, I think it, uh, it doesn't make much sense to go deeper into that. Um, so here again, um, not only sound, but all, also movements. So there are always some species in each community which are producing very conspicuous dances. Uh, in the US, it's a subula species. In South America, it's, for example, Peruvia nigro magnata. You see they have a nice white antenna and they use it from over there sorting producing of a dance with these antenna. And then there's the one which I have studied in Germany, which is Gomphosoripus rufus from Eurasia, which is also producing a very complex dance in front of the female plus a sound. So in fact, we don't need only sound databases, we need movie databases to, to get all the information 
uh, we have YouTube, but I would say as uh, scientists and museum people, we can't rely on YouTube to store our data. Um, so here I leave that away. I think it's just the tympanum uh, inside and the, the sound um, reception range. It's going up to 40 kilohertz. And um, now that said, um, the as I said, the high ultrasound component of insect sounds, especially from katydids, with, which go up to 120 kilohertz in uh, in the South American jungle, require that uh, we record with high sampling rates. MP3 is by no means enough. So here you see. Uh, the MP3, this is this violet uh, line power spectrum um, against a rough file which covers the entire spectrum, I think in this case up to 40 kilohertz. And uh, you see that the MP3, of course, is cut. So you are only covering a part of the spectrum. In grasshoppers, that works. But in Katie, it's it in most cases it, it, it doesn't work. So uh, you don't get them with an MP3 if you are targeting them. And if you have MP3 uh, files from soundscapes, um, it might be problematic to use them. But if you want to study rhythm, like cricket uh, uh, rhythm of, of, of their songs, then it's sufficient. So here's a nice paper by uh, Filippo Buzzetti and Pavan, which make a plea for using wideband uh, sound recorders for field investigation. That's easy to say because we, now we have these cheap machines. And uh, in, in, I would say a decade ago, it, it was impractical. Only very few people did ultrasound recording in Orthoptera. So now I come to the soundscapes and uh, my idea of using bioacoustic monitoring for assessing insect diversity in tropical forests. So um, as you all know, insects make the bulk of diversity, especially Coleoptera and guesstimates of species on earth. You remember this interesting discussion between uh, Irving and Stork. Uh, Irving 30 million stock top that 80 million species on earth based on canopy fogging data and extrapolations. Uh, so there was a huge discussing going, discussion of going on, but I think everybody is zooming in now into uh, sort of 5 million species. Um, but how can insect diversity be mapped or monitored if most species don't even have a name? So I thought that uh, bioacoustic re uh, recording and classification of Orthroptera uh, is a non-invasive rapid assessment of species communities, particularly in species-rich tropical forest habitats. And what you can do is uh, monitor species presence absence, you can monitor species ranges and detect endemisms. Uh, so that would be species discovery. If I record a sound which is not yet in my database, it is uh, probably a new species, maybe a new species, and I have to go on searching. And on a regular basis, you can do species monitoring, species abundance uh, throughout the year or during recovery of ecosystems activity patterns, community patterns, extirpation rates, and species recovery. So acoustic profiles of orthoptera communities, however, are rare. So we have some of my work here and Nish, my doctoral student, which we did in, in, in Ecuador. Uh, then we have the cricket recordings in North America by Walker which are all database in the SENA, the uh, Singing Insect of North America database. Great work. Uh, 
Uh, and we have the work uh, from Otto and Alexander in Australia, but it's, this is published as a book. Uh, then we have the group of uh, Balakrishnan in, in India. And then we have the whole bunch of people who are doing passive acoustic monitoring and establishing bioacoustic indices, acoustic entropy. And of course, if you look into these um, um, bioacoustic diversity indices, you see that many of them are driven by insects. Uh, for example, this seminal work here by Sir, by Acoustic Entropy in Tanzanian Forest, uh, uh, where he has uh, introduced his uh, uh, bioacoustic diversity index. And, um, but of course, uh, this is uh, general and it doesn't go into the single uh, sound tracks. So, um, so let's have a look into these, for example, these old work here from Australia, which is published as a book. There should be some tapes around somewhere. And uh, there are these songs without a voucher. So there should be a species out there which has not yet been collected. The same by the work from Holger Brown in Loja, Ecuador, 25 songs which are characteristic song patterns, but without a voucher. So still much work to collect them. And finally, um, again, our work in, in Panama um, with crickets, uh, uh, 13 crickets songs without a voucher, which we still have not yet collected. But even if we have a collected specimen, it doesn't help us much, much because now the whole taxonomy has to start. So I call these specimens, which don't have a, a scientific name, types of tomorrow, because they will be the holotypes for the hopefully described uh, species in the future. But we have everything there. We have the specimen, we have the song, and um, so for future taxonomists, it should be possible to describe the species and hopefully it will also exist in the wild, continue to exist. So let's go to some of the soundscapes. Um, here I have featured some distinct uh, places in distinct part of the world. So this is the yellow one here in the Italian Alps. This was only a snapshot, a habitat to similar where I am now, uh, Mediterranean. Now here, this is the uh, Ecuadorian rainforest, uh, where I've done quite a lot of recording. And here is Panama, where we have done this more sophisticated work, including ultrasound work uh, which I will comment in a minute. And finally, we have um, uh, my seminal work, with, which Ben mentioned in the introduction in the 1990s in Borneo, where I used cassettes and an array of microphones uh, to do simultaneous recordings of, um, of, a, of a soundscape in the, uh, in the canopy of an uh, uh, of a Malaysian rainforest in Borneo, Sabah, Borneo. So let's have a look into the soundscapes. Uh, here, the Italian soundscapes, where I, which was rather quiet, no cicada at this time of the year, but very nice song of an acridid of a short horn grasshopper. Rio Aguarica, Aguarica, Ecuador, uh, with a dense band of crickets and frogs and uh, this doesn't go up high in the ultrasound otherwise we would see a little bit more here and uh, the barro colorado soundscape looks uh, similar with this again with this band here which is produced by very small crickets between eight and uh, five kilohertz 
And finally, uh, pouring Saba Malaysia, which uh, sounds quite different. And uh, this is dominated by cicadas and uh, also some terigonidae, but which are more sounding like frogs. So already visually you see that uh, the sound is quite distinct. So uh, this was my arrangement for, for the uh, for the rain for, for, the, for the canopy in uh, in Saba. So we had sort of a, a canopy walkway. This was the experimental one, uh, work in progress. And you see here's a microphone hidden. These were electrate microphones and I uh, connected with 50 meter cables uh, to mixers. And so I could select the channel. And so I went in five minutes interval from microphone to microphone and taped all this um, on cassette. And these are the small electric microphones. Okay, so this was this. And fortunately, we have digitized great part of it. And we also have elaborated uh, at least uh, the cicadas, which were dominant, as said. Uh, so we found out this special uh, dusk chorus uh, of, of cicadas. But still, there, there is some work to do. There are still some, um, some species which we can't uh, coordinate with the respective voucher specimen. And 30 years after the focal recording of um, KDD, we finally managed to describe the species. So as said, we had the song, we had the recording, we had the specimen, and uh, thanks to iNaturalist, we also had some photo, uh, Siegfried English got enthusiastic when he saw these photographs here from closely related uh, species, also from Borneo. So uh, we described this bizarre uh, pink, Katie did from Borneo, and yeah, this is the ideal case, the voucher specimen and the sound and uh, stridulatory file. Maybe it would be good to have the genetics and then the song available in a publicly accessible database. So that's the ideal case. We just published another paper on the Mecopoda. So you see how important it is to keep these voucher specimens safely in museums and to maintain the association between sound recording and, um, and specimen. How much time have I got more? So I was uh, just going to write a message about that. Usually we end at... Um, 11 30 so in five minutes but okay. i i think especially because you're getting to um topics related to the soundscape and um all of this is very interesting um i think that you know we could go long longer if you still have um slides that you'd like to present on this topic and i we also have some questions that i'd love to um get your thoughts on um, with regards to, um, I don't know, the future of describing insects using acoustic monitoring and um, uh, just various questions. So I hope that we have time for that as well. Are you able to stay a little I'm bit longer? Able, yeah, 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 yes, yes. I, I okay. have no problem. Okay, so, so I go and I think there are 10 minutes more and then I, I, I'm done. Um, so, Okay, so here now our Panama. Um, uh, the Panama station, uh, maybe some of you know BCI, Barro Colorado Island, uh, managed by Smithsonian, of course, is a gem in tropical, uh, it's a mecca of tropical biology uh, research. Uh, I have the impression that about 30% of the publications about tropical ecology and tropical organisms are in some way or the other made in Barro Colorado Island. Uh, and particularly what was fascinating for us as neuroethologists uh, 
um, trying to combine sound production and nervous perception uh, was the avail availability of labs. So we had lab space there, and here you see um, Arne Schmidt, uh, who was a doctoral student, and Anna Einhobel, who helped us. And this is Heiner Römer, who is a, a very famous neuroethologist because he developed the inter alia because he developed the biological microphone. So this is mainly making nervous recordings in the field. So you have a, a, a catered it and you have electrodes attached to, to their ears. And, um, and uh, so you can record actually what the, uh, what the catered it is hearing in all this uh, mess of sound. And um, so, but that was not our, exactly our topic and I'm coming back to what Ben just mentioned. So these are the soundscapes here, which I already showed. And here a little bit clearer, you see already distinct patterns of crickets characterized by their distinct rhythms. And you see here some uh, higher pitched cadence. So now you apply filters and you can, um, uh, you can filter out, for example, this uh, six kilohertz cricket. This is one way of isolating species. The other way is focal recording where you go around as you all know, with a parable and, um, and record species. And the third is uh, to make your acoustic library to record crickets in captivity. So we collected crickets at light or with pitfall traps and had them in the lab and made the recordings. And then we had everything, uh, uh, the, the recording and the voucher specimen, etc. So we could uh, establish a, a, a sound library of the species occurring at this place. And I think this is necessary because probably a species singing with these acoustic parameters here, maybe you find a similar species in Amazonia or in, even in Borneo, uh, but this will definitely be a different one from, from the Panamanian one. So each community would, should be studied on its own and you should have this, uh, uh, this library and reference library, and reference data set. And yesterday a colleague here from Alicante asked me, so how much is the distance? How, how, how far do you have to go to find new endemisms? And I said, I think you simply don't know. And I, I think in Panama, for example, with this, uh, humidity gradient you uh, in 100 kilometers maybe you already find another community of crickets and even here in Alicante with all its mountains and valleys and so on you probably have a lot of micro uh, endemisms um, and so so we did this work uh, which we published in some neuroethology and so on but still there are a lot of species which don't have a a scientific name and um, I didn't have the nerves to go deep into the taxonomy. It was really difficult. You need a very good taxonomist to do the work. So Paris uh, has a group, Desute, et cetera, and, and Tony Robilia who are doing that. And But as said, this uh, for us as a, let's say from an ecology or ethology point of view, it's enough to have this ethos species. And uh, we give it a preliminary name and we even can database the preliminary name and that's it for our studies. And uh, with Katie, it's a it looks a little bit better. And uh, just yesterday or so, uh, a, a paper appeared about the Katie calling TDT from soundscape recordings in Panama. So finally, some sounds and uh, I didn't write to those. So maybe um, now you are able to guess what is what. Any 
guesses? Uh, Diego says uh, cicada, and I think it might be from Borneo. Yes, yes. It's Pomponia Imperatoria from Borneo. It's, uh, it's uh, the do dominant uh, species in the, in the evening corals. Yes, great. Let's so, see if let's... Uh, the Acoustic Methods um, audience, or uh, let's say if we can be um, undefeated in this quiz, we can uh, mine the collective knowledge. Yeah, no, that was great. Okay, so it looks like we think it's a cricket. Yes. Um, potentially from, is it from Tanzania or where? where's the cricket from? Uh, Alicante. Ah, okay. <laughs> and it could also be from, um, from, uh, from the US. Uh, these are called tree crickets, Ocantine, uh, and they all sound like this. And, um, some and you can go into the parameters and uh, they also look like very much they are sort of transparent wings uh, so yes these are the tree crickets Three crickets. These are the three crickets, and I played this show that there are several of them. You, you hear that the stone is a little If you bit pause different. it, we can hear you better. There we go. Or if you can pause it, we could hear you better. There we go. Uh, there we go. Uh, okay. yeah. uh, I played this one because um, uh, you heard different individuals uh, with different frequencies and different intensities. So uh, these were made with the audio mod recorder right at the right 10 minutes from from our city home here in Alicante and some badlands and uh, they're there in the evening and a day you see nothing you see nothing uh, yeah. of these tickets and yes they and even at night it's very difficult because they are so transparent but with the audio mod you capture tons of them and uh, as said, there are several of those with different frequencies, and you see how they answer each other. So, so even from the soundscape recordings, you can do a little bit of a of a density estimate. So, so, I'm wondering if we should get to some questions because I know that yeah. some people have um, were eager to speak with you. I didn't even realize. I'll just keep this very short, but. You know, your 1993 paper, um, Larissa just uh, told, um, put that paper in the chat, but we can send it again. You were one of the first people to really um, think about acoustically monitoring biodiversity within, especially in tropical forests. And so it's just, again, it's so cool to be uh, speaking with you. And um, if anybody has any questions about, um, 
you know, insect sounds and passive acoustic monitoring data. Um, let's let's open the let's have a let's have a good discussion. Yes. So I will open up this window so I can see more of you. Okay. And you are, you are selecting the questions. I don't see all the hands and so on. Okay. Um, I have a question, Ben. Ah, uh, yeah, Bruges. Hi. Sure. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. It was very insightful, um, especially for people uh, who have uh, a background in terrestrial bioacoustics here. Um, so it's a very general question. Um, I and mean, we have all heard reports uh, about uh, that suggest that the abundance of uh, insects is in drastic decline. Um, I mean, which is uh, quite worrying. Um, um, so what would you say about uh, the advances in machine learning and deep learning? Um, and what could uh, these tools provide us? Like how could they help providing potential new solutions? Uh, to this global ch uh, challenge, so uh, so I would so I would like you to like uh, con contrast it with uh, the terrestrial uh, taxonomy. So, what would be the challenges that we would face with uh, uh, in contrast to, uh, for instance, birds or other mammals like marine mammal uh, bioacoustics? Uh, so, when we would exploit machine learning tools to do uh, passive acoustic monitoring. Yes, um, actually, we, we did quite a lot of work about machine learning, and I left that out finally. I first wanted to put it into the talk, but it was definitely um, too long. Um, to make a long story short, the, the basic problem with machine learning is um, that uh, even more than by human identification, you need reference recordings. So even a machine can't help you if you only have a voucher specimen. No, if you have a voucher specimen and, uh, and reference recording, it's good. Uh, machine learning, for example, could help you to, uh, to make these libraries faster. So it could all the work which I showed you, which we have done by hand, like filtering and so on, um, uh, you could do unsupervised uh, learning and you could say, okay, here are tons of recordings from, uh, from the forest in India or in anywhere. Uh, machine, please uh, tell me how many different patterns you can recognize. So now you get a bunch of files uh, due to machine classification, unsupervised. You go into that and then you see, aha, there's a bird. We know that that's for the birders. Uh, that, these are the insects. There are 10 of those uh, and so on. So at least you get the mechanic work done more quickly. But this doesn't save you from carefully collecting and from focal recording uh, as we did it in Panama. Somebody has to do that but anyway um it's great to make rapid assessments it, it's great to make rapid assessments and um I'm, I'm a little bit unhappy i must say with the uh, bioacoustics indices because the bioacoustic indices don't tell me much about how many insects are there i, I would rather have a machine run over these recordings and say, how many insects do you think are in there? Or you could also probably program easily the machines to differentiate what we just did, a cricket from a cicada and uh, a catered it, et cetera. I think that's an easy task. And maybe there's some confusion between a frog and a cricket, and maybe between some bird and a grasshopper, but this is marginal. So it would be great to accelerate our work, but we do need uh, the underlying databases. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you so much.
one question. Oh, um, Diego, do you want to read your question or I can also read it if you like? Uh, yes, I can. It's a little bit noisy around here, but yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. It was uh, super insightful. I, I enjoy it very much, especially the, the historical summary. It was super, super interesting. Um, what do you think about automatic species identification of insects? Uh, I know a lot of work has yet to be done in that regard. I've, I've uh, been researching about it and I see most of the species of, uh, identification models uh, are mainly used with birds. And, and, and frogs, but not a lot of work on, on insects. So do you think they may be useful for the future of, of uh, acoustic monitoring of insects? Yes, definitely, of course. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I would say the, the underlying um, uh, technology of feature extraction, et cetera, is basically is basically the same you just have a another range of frequency you are going more into the ultrasonic what you never will manage is to do machine identification of mp3 sounds of katydids which are singing above 20 kilohertz because it's not in the signal huh? but uh, if the signal is good and you run the identification and then uh, of course it should work as well as for birds. You have the training data sets and uh, you have the, um, uh, you have the uh, uh, recursive networks or whatever, and you can do it. And for example, uh, um, uh, I'm working a little bit with BirdNet now to, to identify the birds which are around here. And it works so nice. So, so I think it also should work for, for, for insects. But you just need the training data. And we do have the training data for the, for the European ones. We do have the training data. Uh, so it, it could be done, yes. And the problem will be probably the user interface. Because as said, the user is recording an MP3. So um, how can he catch? Uh, 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 the katydid, which is singing the ultrasound, so maybe he has to connect to, to a bat detector. So it's more on this side. But from the machine learning side, this will, this will all be there in five years. We have that perfect. The problem is the input side, garbage in, garbage out. You see, if we don't have nice reference data, we are lost. But still, we maybe we can we can program a, 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 a machine learning program which can say, OK, I, as, as a machine, I identify 20 orthoptera in the soundscape. That would already be useful hmm, for rapid assessment. Um, so we've got a question from Tiago. Um, how do you see future work with insect acoustics with songs um, now being available in something like a Xenocanto database? And then following up on that, I'm wondering um, if you see like um, a time in the future, let's say it's 20 years or 50 years, do you think we'll know the majority of um, sound, like if we'll be able to identify the majority of sounds to insect species, um, and what is your time frame for when you see that happening? Is that like where we should be pushing? So first is, do you see, um, how do you see the future of working with insect sounds? Is this going to be in some sort of database like in Xenocanto? And then what do you see the process for continuing to ID insect sounds in the future? Where are we going? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe maybe I start with the last one. Um, uh, the idea of insect sounds, of course, is uh, closely connected to the taxonomic impediment. So you need um, you need close cooperation with taxonomists to to do the taxonomist proper. Uh, even numbering the species doesn't help too much because you have to go into the details. So 
you see um, my colleagues now, uh, Hella and Ingrid, uh, even older than I am. So um, um, they are at, in Brazil, there is a, a good taxonomy tradition now. And um, uh, so I hope uh, that uh, from there, uh, from, uh, from southern countries, uh, we will get good taxonomists to, to do that. And then the other point are the databases and Xenocantos, et cetera. That's a um, soft spot, I would say. Um, 20 years ago, I was more enthusiastic than I am now because we made this DOSA database and we had the server in Ulm and we had uh, 6,000 songs and it all worked on the internet. And you know what happened? Uh, the guy who managed this server died last year. And the successor in the department decided not to continue these servers. So long-term archiving is crucial for all this. And it cannot be done at a university because there comes another uh, professor and he said, oh, what is this machine over there? Let's save energy and switch it off. So I think the only institutions which can do um, a solid archiving are the museums, long-term institutions. Uh, the museums do a good job for archiving specimens, but they are still do a lousy job in digital processing and digital archiving. Uh, digital long-term archiving uh, is, is a, I would say, generally an unsolved problem. So this has to be solved. Otherwise, we will always start from the beginning. And that's where I am with Xeno Canto. Uh, we recently had a, a meeting with a European orthopterist and Xeno Canto was uh, demonstrated and it's a great tool, but in a way they presented it as if they were starting with zero. So they were ignoring everything what we have done. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, particularly because they, they were uh, up to now they were concentrating on mp3 so uh, now they are allowing WAV files that's good but still in Xenocanto the the, uh, the link to the voucher specimen is a bit missing uh, we have this in orthoptera species file but we don't have it in Xenocanto and actually it's not very necessary in Europe but if you want to go to the tropics, you need the voucher specimens and you need this link. So the cooperation between museums and databases and long-term archiving is crucial. If we manage, maybe with your help, to push that, then I see a great future. And otherwise the, the future is bleak. The, the internet will just disintegrate and we always will forget what already has been done and, uh, yeah, so that, that's my prediction. I think if everything works fine in, in 20 years, we, we, are, uh, we are good at recognize, automatic recognizing and databases and so on. Otherwise we will get lost. And finally, we have to save the rainforest then. Eh? Don't forget that. Otherwise, what, what, what do you want to record? Does anybody have any um, questions? I have one more in the chamber ready. So um, there's a lot of work coming out that's using um, acoustic monitoring recordings to learn about um, habitat condition or the effects of restoration or disturbance. And um, especially if they're using um, not necessarily acoustic indices, but in many cases they are using some type of acoustic indices or let's say measuring the power and different band levels. Insects are, you know, an outsized contributor to the soundscape and yet they're, 
um, oftentimes the taxonomic group that, at least in my experience, that I I have the least amount of ecological knowledge about these different insects. And so what I'm wondering is, you know, in if we're trying to learn about, um, let's say, restoration outcomes, and we have acoustic monitoring recordings for multiple sites, um, beyond just doing these sort of broad sweeping measurements, do you have any recommendations? Are there, should we focus on like the most um, obvious or most common um, sound producers? Should we take time to do some research into um, what might be like um, disturbance sensitive insect species and look for, should we pour, pour through the archives? What are some strategies? Because I know a lot of us here are trying to use acoustic monitoring recordings to learn about um, land use effects and, and the like. So what would be a good roadmap for how we can more intelligently um, get the most out of insect sounds in yeah, this respect. It, it, actually, uh, I have a talk about that. <laughs> um, and um, as you say, uh, selecting sensitive species or some sort of flagship species or critically endangered species uh, would be a good strategy. Uh, for example, there is a band wing grasshopper in California and uh, which is producing a crackling sound and of course uh, this is critically critically endangered trimerotrope is something i have the slide but let's let's leave it there and um so um, the alliance of zero extinction even has this uh, species on its list uh, so we know where it is we know the sounds it produces, so a monitoring program sort of focusing on this insect would be uh, would be really useful. And um, the correlation with vertebrates, I don't know, but I'm sure that there, there are many correlations. I, I know of one work, I hope on who did that, and this was in the concept, context of insect decline, which you mentioned, the worrying insect decline. Uh, particularly in industrialized countries due to pesticides, I would say. Um, and this was correlating the, uh, the abundance of certain birds predating on big insects uh, with orthoptera and uh, terigonidae. Terigonidae are like this and fat and um, they are prey of many birds. And uh, he could show that the decline of these big insects was going hand in hand with uh, the decline. I think it was a certain falcon, a small falcon, uh, which was declining. So yes, of course, uh, focusing on certain, on certain target species would, would be excellent. And there's another work uh, by Google about restoration ecology, what you mentioned. And th this was an island in Mauritius, and they eradicated the invasive plant species and they planted the original plant species. And they used the small cricket as an indicator species. And the small cricket is indicative of the native forest. So, so you could use that and uh, with sound recorders. And this uh, sound recording can be done by park personnel, by rangers. You just put uh, the sound recorder there and in week, weekly, in weekly rhythm, researchers go there, or you even can send the chips by mail. You see the stored chips. Uh, and so there are a lot of possibilities to, to, uh, to facilitate, streamline this monitoring and even automatize it. I just like to to mention that it seems that as important as it is to get more people also invested in becoming specialists in the taxonomy of and systematics of these species, meaning it's again bringing more from what has been done in the past in terms of biological studies. It's also interesting to 
in, uh, to get people to under, also understand the behavior and the natural history of these organisms. So we can then understand the particularities and their ecology and what should be targeted at monitoring maybe in a more effective way rather than investigating communities or not. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that's my personal interest though, because, uh, okay, it's nice to have the name, it's nice to have the song and it's uh, nice to have these numbers and data, but actually what I'm interested in uh, are the, uh, the, the behaviors and strategies and so on, which are, which are so different uh, and what are they actually doing? And for example, take North American grasshoppers. Uh, we have the work by Otto who did sonograms and amazingly we don't have recordings of North American grasshoppers available and even the behavioral studies are completely lagging. It got out of fashion. We have lots of crickets and katydids due to Tom Walker and due to the neurologist, but uh, these behaviors of grasshoppers which are flying around in the prairie and fluttering and doing dances and so on fascinating uh, at the moment you find more on youtube than in the scientific literature because people are fascinating they are filming it and um but but we don't have it in the databases because, because so beyond the acoustic database we need movie databases well mm -hmm. graded movie databases and where we document these these behaviors and then if um if we're interested in learning more about um community biodiversity patterns let's say or at least of acoustically active species even if we don't know the majority of insect species and we don't have a connection with a really good taxonomist or the ability to do the necessary field work would you still say um, that it's of value to produce these sort of um, what did you, I, you call them like sonotypes or ethnos ethos sounds? Uh, sonotypes or ethos species. Ethos yeah. species. So if yeah. we have a acoustic monitoring data set, um, what's the value and what can we do with that um, ethos species? list of those different insect sounds that we've found in our data well uh, for example you could do mapping uh, because you probably you are recording at distinct sites and maybe you detect a really uh, conspicuous insect song there and you can identify it i still have some from uruguay which i haven't collected but they are well identified and you can map it uh, so, so we can map the unknown, but uh, you know, if, if uh, soundscape recordings are well stored, then uh, it should be possible, ideally, it should be possible to work the taxonomy out decades later. But still you can publish a work about a certain species which you found always in this habitat associated with i don't know what bog and um, so of course that's extremely valuable the point is that these data should be shared these uh, um, these audio scapes i will add when when i put my talk into the uh, into the web then i will add some more slides going into the direction of your of your question. And again, I have a lot of examples from nice uh, databases of soundscapes, which were switched off now. It's also a question of, uh, of cost, of course. So it has to be big institutions and maybe we have to think of, not of tapes, but of ways to store uh, digital information independent from electricity and from hard disks. You know, the famous Kubrick little hologram crystal, something like that. Uh, uh, passive storage of data. That, that's, uh, I think that will come in the future. So, so but then it, um, 
for ecologists, it's absolutely valuable, I, I would say. Um, maybe we've got one last question. Jose, would you? Um, so Jose is wondering, what alternatives would there be to think of um, in, in cases where orthoptera overlap um, in the frequency of other vertebrates um, so that maybe I'm re reading, like if, what do you do in the case that there's many insect sounds that overlap? Jose, is that your question? Um, let's see. I think he he might be meaning that is there is this overlap on purpose? Does it say something about if they are competing for that? Ah, yeah. Huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so that um, and then if you have any thoughts on the acoustic niche hypothesis in the context of that question, um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, there there are some works about that, and actually we did some work about that in Panama, but. Um, uh, you know, uh, insects have been first, so long before the vertebrates, vocalizing vertebrates. So uh, maybe there's some direct input like a, a loud vertebrate calling, sort of uh, interrupting the insect. But basically, Basically, I would say these are two different worlds. So there is a uh, few overlaps, there's few overlap. Uh, I would rather say inside the insect world, for example, the cicada, which are so active here in, in, in during some part of the day or in some part of the season, um, the cicadas are really sort of, uh, stopping other acoustic activity, but vertebrates, I think, are no problem. Even traffic noise, there are some problem, uh, some work about traffic noise and shifting in frequencies in insects. Um, I don't see, I don't see much effect. Bats are a thing. So if you have a bat, I have several recordings where I have the impression that the bat is coming and the katydid it is stopping. So yeah, that's an interaction, but it's in the in the ultrasound. Okay. So uh, let me. I didn't look into the chat. I must admit because I was busy with the talk. So now I will type in with my suggestion where to put the talk. And it's www. The so that will be the directory where I put up the stuff. And Perfect. then uh, we stay in touch, I hope. Yeah, sure. We can definitely share the link of the talk for those that are interested in seeing your talk. And there are people that already asked for the link to your recording later, to see later. And we'll share the link together of the presentation itself. And I appreciate it Klaus, for you having the time and taking the time actually to join us today in this talk. I hope everyone enjoy it. And we keep the talk, of course. Okay. I'm thanks just so much, Klaus. The chat. Thank so, you. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye bye. Take care.